It's so good to see you today. Now, I, I think I have my next favorite anthem. Raise your hands. Wasn't that a beautiful anthem? And I fully anticipated that as I stood up and came out for children's moment, that every hand in the congregation would be just like that. But because you talked about the things in life we should praise God for, and wow, how good God ha has been to us, there's no doubt about that. God has really been stirring in my heart the past couple of weeks, and, and then again, more so this past week, about part three of a two-part sermon series entitled Eternity Matters. And as I studied the past couple of three weeks for the past two sermons, God just made something very evident in my heart and mind that I, I could not continue forward in sermons or sermon series without addressing this uh, particular thing. So today we're going to talk about Eternity Matters again. It's part three of a two-part sermon series, like I said. And there's been some conversation about the sermon title. Do we have the sermon title we can put up there? Da, 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 da. Maybe, maybe not. Good is not enough. My wife read that on the blast that went out Thursday or Friday, and she said, Ricky, why did you... Why, why are you preaching a sermon that says God is not enough? And I thought, oh, ah, you know. No, please tell me that's not what it says. And she read it again. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I, I left one of the O's out. Good is not enough. God is certainly enough and so much more. Good is not enough. Uh, so as I really thought and pondered that this past week, um, I begin to think back on two different people in, in my history as a pastor. One was probably in his 40s, the other was in his 70s. Two people who had grown up in church, were active in church, had been leaders in the church. The older of the two had actually been on the SPRC while I was pastor at the church. The older of the two had a conversation with me one day a few months before he passed away. And he said, Brother Ricky, I stood in my kitchen and I looked out the kitchen window into the backyard. And after having lived my life and served in the church and on various committees, I've been a good citizen, I've had a great career, he said, standing there looking out into the backyard, I realized that after 70-something years, I did not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Wow. I had another gentleman who was on a team at church, had been there for four years, had been very active, and sat at his home one evening and just kind of understood I don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Both good men lived good lives. Neither had a relationship with Jesus Christ. They had lived good lives. But church, Scripture is very clear. Good is not enough. Amen? I'm so glad this morning I'm hearing a lot of amens out there in the congregation. I want to share with you some verses from Matthew chapter 19. And I've kind of changed this up a little bit. So I'm just going to invite you to listen. You don't have to put that on the screen. Don't put those scriptures up there. Because I'm going to read a little bit more than what I originally told them. But you, you remember the story, maybe, in Matthew when the uh, rich young ruler came to Jesus. In verse number 16, Matthew chapter 19 now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, listen to what he says, What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So his question assumes that doing good things will enable him to have eternal life. So he, Jesus, said to him, Why do you call me good? 
No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And he replied, which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love the neighbor, your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Wow, that's pretty bold, isn't it? Yes. So Jesus replies, If you want to be perfect, Go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Now as you read down through that little exchange between Jesus and this rich young ruler, please note that when Jesus mentioned the commands to follow, he left out covetousness. You shouldn't covet. But he also didn't say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That and love your neighbors yourself are the two great commands. So even though the gentleman presented himself as a good man, Jesus saw where his heart truly was. And it was wrapped up in the things that he possessed. And because he loved his possessions more than he loved God, when Jesus invited him to follow him, he had to say, I don't think so. He walked away sorrowful. He held on to earthly treasures, forfeiting, if his heart and life never changed, an eternal treasure in Christ Jesus that now he would never know or be able to love. Living a morally good life by the world's standards is not enough to enter the kingdom of God. You must be born again. John chapter 3. You must place your faith in Jesus Christ. Being good is not enough. Now those who are depending on their quote-unquote good works alone may very well hear these words from Christ that he mentions in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. We mentioned this last Sunday. Not everyone who calls out, calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Do you hear the relationship in that? Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Now you may also remember in Luke chapter 10, Jesus had sent the 70 out to proclaim the kingdom. And in verse number 17, the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. But listen to what Jesus said after he said that. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that you can do good things, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Isn't that powerful? Rejoice because you're a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So Scripture makes it clear, and we'll read another verse or two of Scripture in just a few moments, that living a good life is not enough to enter into the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And I do not want any of you to live another day outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ if you're not there, thinking that the good things that you do are enough. Now then, I'm going to get some help with my sermon today because not only in my past have I had people who had this experience, I also have at least one here as well. I know I have two because I have another story from this church of someone who grew up in church and, 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 and uh, participated in the praise team and, and did good things and then they found out they had no faith in Christ. So, if... Uh, I could, I want to invite Mike Rooks up to uh, help me with my sermon this morning. 
Now, Mike, Jesus kind of makes it clear, Paul makes it clear in other places, that living a good life is not enough. I'd like to ask you, have you lived a good life? I have started out trying to have a good life and lead a good life. Uh, as a young man or a young boy, I was raised in the Methodist church, uh, went through confirmation. Uh, I had a very strict and very stern father that put up with no nonsense. And I lived my life that way. And from my early days, that is the way I moved forward. I carried this on into uh, my young adulthood, trying to be good, trying to be a good person, but I did not have a relationship with God. Jan and I were married. We moved to Gunnersville, where I accepted the job of running a local business here. I tried to run that business with integrity, honesty, and tried to be a good person to everybody that I knew trying to be a good person, but it wasn't in my heart. As we marched along, we had three daughters. Jan and her three daughters, we became involved in the local Baptist church, and we were faithful members. We were active in church. I was baptized. I even became a deacon and served several years on the deacon board. Moving along as, as life, things happen, just things happen in life, and foolish mistakes and decisions that I made, my mindset became that God did not know that I was even down here. I didn't even feel like my prayers got any higher than the, than the roof. So, as we move along, this good man that tried to be a good man and wanted to be a good man, he rebelled. <clears throat> On Sunday mornings, instead of going to church, I would, could be found on the golf course. If my wife went to church, I became a golf bum. <laughs> so, but it's still, but I had a heart that was hard as leather and had no relationship whatsoever with God or Jesus. So in, in the eyes of, of the people in the community, they looked at you and saw a good man doing good things, but they really couldn't see the true condition of your heart, the emptiness there. You, you've you've uh, described it as, as leather and things of that nature. I think if, if you went around town at that time, people would say that Mike Rux was a good man. I wasn't a great person, but I was a good fellow. And that's what I wanted to be. But, as I know now, that won't, that doesn't get the job done. So, I know your story is a lot, a lot deeper than that, and we don't have time to go into the, 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 the bigger details. And, hey, if you'd love to hear more of Mike's story, I would invite you to uh, ask him about that. It's, it's fantastic. But, there had to be some point in life, some circumstance of life, that took you from being a good man to being a godly man. Could you tell us a little bit about that? The, the three most precious things in my life were my daughters. Um, they are golden to me. Later on, some other people came into that life that even outdid them. That's their grandchildren. Yeah. So what happened... Our youngest daughter was uh, expecting triplets. She got into the early stages of her third trimester, and she started having health issues that uh, could have compromised her life along with the triplets. The, um, it all turned out well. The, we had a... 2 pound 10 ounce, a 2 pound 12 ounce, and a 1 pound 13 ounce born. Caroline and ja uh, Jackson were the larger ones. They got to go home. But Jonathan, the little 1 pounder, he had to stay in the hospital 
for nearly three months. And that is where all of this started. You, you told me about uh, some time you spent with God on the highway coming back home to Gunnersville. It kind of reminded me uh, of Paul's road to Damascus encounter with Jesus. Uh, I think about Paul on the road to Damascus. I think about uh, Mike on the road to Gunnersville. Could you tell us a little bit about your encounter with God as you journeyed back to Gunnersville? I had been to Charleston, South Carolina to visit the family, and Jonathan was still in the hospital, and Jan was there helping Mary Ann because she had two at home and one at the hospital. So it, it was quite, quite hectic. But I had gone over that weekend, and on Sunday before I came back to Gunnersville, I went by the hospital. Jonathan had just been cleared of having the flu. And if you can imagine weighing three pounds and having the flu, he had been a sick little fellow. So that Sunday morning on the way home, I went by the hospital. I got to hold him for about two hours, just he and I bonding. And a little fellow like right here would just snuggle right up under your neck. And, uh, but he and I bonded. Now, this is where it gets interesting. On the way home, riding along Interstate 20, somewhere between Augusta and Atlanta, I don't remember where, but I do know, I remember everything that went on. I heard a voice, not an audible voice, but something down in here. And it Brother Bill, it wasn't that quiet, still voice that you used to talk about. It was like it was thumping me, and it said, Mike Rux, what do you mean I don't know that you're down there? I had already made the decision. God did not know that I existed and that he didn't hear my prayers, so, you know, why should I go to church? But it said, why, you know, I know you're down there. And just like that, it was like pictures. Boom, boom, boom. Showing me times in my life when I should have been hurt, killed, or things happening to me that would have destroyed me. At the same time, he said, this voice told me, you know, these decisions that, you know, what's happened to you, most of those decisions were your decision. And the voice said, when did you ever come to me and ask for your direction? And, and I didn't. So on the way home, all of this stuff started happening. And what is so miraculous about this, this Baptist church that I told you that I was attending, the pastor sitting in here right now, Brother Bill Milliken. Things that I heard him say 20 years ago started coming up in my mind. Things that did not even register to me back in those days. But it started, they just started popping and seeing things like that. I felt my heart, that piece of leather, I felt that piece of leather starting to soften. And what's so amazing about it, that night, as I was coming into Gunnersville, I had never in my life been so at peace in this body. It felt like weight had been lifted off of me. I was more at peace with myself. I had, and during that trip, I gained a greater understanding of people that you can't judge a person by one action that they do. You can't, you can't do that. But my heart was, was beginning to soften. And another thing, and I've heard Brother Bill talk about this, and this, this happened. The air that I was breathing was sweeter purer as I came off the mountain into Gunnersville. And, and just like I said, I was just more at peace than I've ever been in my life. You, you talked about uh, uh, something that God required of you. And this is pretty quick after a moment like this about Jonathan, about Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. 
for a couple of hours. Could you share a little bit about that? This was on Sunday when this happened. Monday, I left town and I had to go to Knoxville to work up there that week. Jonathan was still in the neonatal intensive care unit. This was on a Wednesday night. About 11 o'clock, my phone goes off. And I, at 11 o'clock at night, you don't get good phone calls. Jan called me and very quietly and, and very calmly, she said, they called from the hospital, Jonathan had crashed. All of his vital signs had just gone to nothing. And he had been taken back to the uh, intensive care unit and they were working with him. And I said, do I need to come home? And she said, no, wait, we don't know what's going to happen. As I told you, that before all this, my prayers never got any higher than the ceiling. And I really didn't know how to pray. So that night, laying in that hotel room that night, in that bed, the only thing that I could do was, God, please let him live. Please let him live. It was a night of just begging. And you know, that, that was all I could do. That's all the prayer that I could, that I could come up with. But the next morning, after all of that, God wasn't through with me. I'm kind of hard-headed, so, you know, it takes a while to get it. And you folks on the staff need to remember that, that, I, <laughs> that, it, that it takes a while for stuff to get into my head. But that morning, I heard, I heard this voice again, and it said, Mike, give thanks. Give thanks. Well, I started praying, God, thank you for that two hours that I spent with Jonathan. I did not know what the outcome was going to be. But I said, God, thank you for that two hours. That's the most two precious hours I will ever spend in my life is getting to be there for that two hours with that little, that little tiny little boy. So I did. Then I heard a voice that said, hand him over to God. And my prayer was, after I had given thanks for that time with him, my prayer was, God, I'm handing Jonathan over to you. And I will accept whatever your decision is. No matter what it is, whether it's bad or good, I was going to accept it. And I will be the spiritual leader of my family that I had not, I had never been. I offered those two prayers and just like that, I heard that voice. Jonathan is going to be just fine. <laughs> and he did. And he is. The first to walk, first to crawl, first to climb, first to do everything. He is a perfect little boy today. Doing everything great. So at the ripe old age of 63, yes, sir. a good man became a godly man. Yeah. Amen. That is a beautiful, wonderful, powerful testimony. And I greatly appreciate you sharing it with us this morning. Okay? Thank you, sir. Appreciate having you on board as our executive administrator. I want to leave you with two other scriptures, and then we'll have our hymn of response. Jesus said in John 17, 3, as he prayed to the Father, and this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. So Jesus is very clear to define eternal life as relationship with God through faith in Jesus. And then you probably know this one very well, Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 8 and verse number 9. God saved you by His grace when you believed. God saved you when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. But we can boast 
about what God has done for us. Amen? Amen. Church, good is not enough, but God certainly is. Sing with us hymn 365, Grace Greater Than I.